I'm Andrew Henderson, NomadCapitalist.com. This is the Nomad Capitalist Report. We're talking about global entrepreneurship. It's one of the key tenets of finding true freedom in the world. And we're here with Dan from TropicalMBA.com here in Ho Chi Minh City. Dan, welcome to the show. Andrew, pleasure to be here. So let's boil down to this here. You're a, a global entrepreneur. Sure. You're a nomad. You seek out opportunity. So many people, I think, are afraid. They read our site. They read your site. They're afraid or they're worried or they're concerned about taking the step and actually going somewhere because it's so easy. They know how business works in their own country. Sure. What, what was it that made you say, I'm going to get out there and I'm going to find new opportunities? And what did you find? Well, so for me, I mean, I have a little uh, a rule called thou shalt not do local business unless you really know what you're doing. I mean, I think, do think it is tough and worth being scared of coming here and setting up a restaurant or a bar or something like that. I mean, that's, gonna, that's a pretty big learning curve. And I do have friends who do that. For me, as an online entrepreneur, the real opportunity in coming here is capital markets. So if you need investors... Um, there's a lot of money in Southeast Asia in particular, but the biggest opportunity that really brought me here was hiring. Um, so, you know, I'm still selling back to the market that I understand the best. I'm marketing to people in California and the U.S. Out, out what? No, why are you? No, why to California? I tell people to get the hell out of California, <laughs> and we did. So, so for us in California, though, that's where our consumers are. Right. You know, we sell bars, we sell cat furniture, we sell all these consumables that people in California want. Um, but we can run our infrastructure, both financial and uh, sales and, and, and uh, in particular web development, uh, marketing, stuff like this. Why would I hire somebody in California? Um, you know, entry level salary, 32000 plus workers comp, plus insurance, plus blah, blah, blah. You freaking name it. Why not come here to Ho Chi Minh City? Where plus, I he's can... trying to bang your other employees. <laughs> plus, here in Ho Chi Minh City, you know, not only can I hire qualified Vietnamese people, but I can hire expats who want to live here at a much lower rate. This is why I'm so fascinated by what you do. Because you, there's so many guys, and, and you know, I love this, the idea of the, the internet business. But I, sometimes I look at these people and I say, say, some of these guys, it's a real stretch what they're doing. <laughs> you're, you're, you know, you're doing something very simple. It's relatable to people. You're making cat furniture. Yeah. And you're selling it. Uh, it's online. Okay, so I get that. But there's something tangible there. It's not just like I wrote an ebook on the on the top ten ways to uh, you know get more sex at a bar or something. It's like that's already been done. You're doing something. It's like you're doing something different. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people read the Four Hour Work Week and they thought that they could put up a website right. with an ebook on the sidebar, and it was going to be this automated path to profits. And we took a different approach. Just we just said, look, you know, what do we know about? And we knew about manufacturing. Another reason that we're here in Asia is our factories are, you know, just a one hour, one and a half hour plane flight away in southern China. So uh, that's what we knew and that's what we stuck with for our first set of cash flows. And as we're building our asset and our business, we're continuing to get into new things and take bigger risks. But at the beginning, we weren't willing to take a risk on some completely new industry, some completely new idea. For us, it's what we knew, which is making steel products and selling them online. There is a big movement, especially when you get into the real internet community. The guys who are Facebook and who support Facebook and who all the way on down the line, they have to, they say, go to California uh, because that's where the startup community is. Or uh, Tumblr has to be in New York City. And we wrote on Nomad Capitalist a while back when they sold Tumblr. Uh, you could have saved a lot of money being offshore. But the argument is there's no community. Talk about the community you see offshore for entrepreneurs, well, startups. You know, the co-founder of Facebook lives in Singapore. Absolutely. Uh, and when there's a huge group of uh, uh, startup investors there and, uh, you know, if you want startup investment, that's the place to go. Uh, they're dying to find – they have a lack of talent, not a lack of capital, which is the opposite – uh, potentially back home. I'm not exactly sure about all that stuff. I'm not a startup guy. I'm a bootstrapper. So I, I enjoy what the startup guys do and I look at it. So I'll speak from my experience specifically, which is if you want to reduce your costs of living and increase your runway, you can live, my, my friend says it's a champagne lifestyle on a beer budget. You can live a great lifestyle here. The apartment we're staying in right now is completely managed and serviced. I don't do anything. I don't lift a finger. It gets cleaned every single day. The food here is cheap. You could easily live off of $2,000 a month here if you want. If you're an entrepreneur, cash is oxygen. And so a lot of people Absolutely. Come, they come here for that. They come here because they want to earn their time back. They want to have creative freedom. They want to build an asset. And uh, you know, so if you're going to do that in California, your burn rate could be 50, 60 grand a year. 
So I think that that's um, one of the factors. The other thing is that you have a vibrant youth culture. I mean, it feels like some, you're, you're sort of witnessing something happen. The first time I came here in 2001, completely different. When I go back to my hometown in central yeah, Pennsylvania. You, you had a story. You had a story about coming here in 2001, which was very interesting. You were like the first guy to, I think, ever set foot on vi- <laughs> the first white guy Not quite. with a beard to ever. I was 10 years after the opening of Vietnam, and uh, I took a picture of a government building and got interrogated for four hours about it. Um, but it, things have changed so much since then. I mean, that was sort of like a sort of a quasi derpy uh, surveillance state, and they were still trying to figure out how to interact with the world. And now you look. How I mean, times have changed. How times have changed. The- the shoe is now on the other foot. Absolutely. And it's fun to be here for that. I think it's fun to be here, part of the scene. And I think, look, just look at Southeast Asia as a region in general. It's cheap and easy to get around. There's a lot of entrepreneurs here. There's an incredible diversity of culture and experiences. So I think Southeast Asia in general is a great place to be based. Dan, let's, just, let's, let's cut to it, though. I think let's just be honest. <laughs> Uh, you're just here because you can't get laid in the United States. That, that's it, right? <laughs> the LBH be, phenomenon. Be honest. The, the loser back home, right? There is that category of expats. People come looking for love. Hey, I'm not going to judge that. Right. Uh, talk about then, would you go and live in New York? Would you feel comfortable going back there? Or do you feel that the climate, I mean, there's a, there's a palpable energy here. Mm. Would you ever want to go? Because you're talking about stuff that people go to New York or Washington or L.A., that kind of excitement. Would you go back there, or you just you've you've seen the light? Uh, I think the chances of me living ever again long term in the United States are low, but I would love to spend a summer in New York City. I think that's still a special place in the world. Los Angeles too. Um, you know, to live the kind of lifestyle that we live here in New York City could easily cost you th- two, three hundred thousand dollars a year. I mean, the, the the getting on a plane every weekend and and the the high-end eateries every day. I just, you know. So give us an idea of the weekly schedule. What are the things in a, in a week? I mean, no, but seriously, you're, you're getting full back massage. What, like, what are you doing? Uh, for me, you know, the cool thing about, uh, you know, being an entrepreneur in general is that you can organize your life, especially here in Southeast Asia, have very little lifestyle overhead. Um, so for me, it's, I've got clean and clear work sessions where I focus on my creative stuff. I jump on Skype. We've got really fast internet here in Ho Chi Minh City uh, to do client calls or to talk with uh, business partners during the middle of the day. And then in the evenings, I, I meet up with other entrepreneurs here in the city. Um, one of the things that's really been an upgrade being here in Asia is just traveling a lot. You know, like every two and a half, three weeks, I just go buy a plane ticket, last minute, jump on a plane and go meet with entrepreneurs in the region. And, it, and I found it amazing. Uh, even as a guy who travels as much as I do, it, it is so hard in the rest of the world to find cheap fares. Uh, when you're in Singapore, I was in Singapore, and I'm sorry, I was in Kuala Lumpur flying to Singapore, and uh, I looked at the kiosk in the airport. What's the ticket cost to fly the same flight? Eleven dollars. <laughs> I walked up, but, but first of all, I hope you're not flying Jetstar. Are you flying on Jetstar? I have, yeah. Well, stop, please stop immediately. <laughs> I'm never patronizing those a holes ever again. I had a Jetstar flight that was delayed till like 7 the next morning. They want you to sleep out on the sidewalk. And I walked up and said, hey, Vietnam uh, Airlines, what's the business class ticket cost? $151. I am not surprised. You're, going, you're bumming around everywhere here for next to nothing. Absolutely. And, you know, it's the, the infrastructure that's been built up over the last 5 to 10 years in terms of air travel here is stunning. So, you know, quite literally, if you want to, you know, fly to Bangkok tonight, that would be simple for us. Visas on arrivals everywhere in the, in the, in the region. It's about a $90 flight. It's about an hour and a half. And you're on the ground and, uh, you know, meeting up with some new friends, you know, in a, a matter of a few hours. You, you remember growing up in the United States when you'd want to go to Vegas and you, you'd get this itch the last minute. You can't do that anymore. You can do that here, though. Yes. I think that uh, the other thing about living in the United States is that it's going to cost you four times as much and none of your friends are going to want to come with you. Uh, I I would, you know, there's something in the scene of these Dijerati, expat entrepreneurs, whatever you want to say. I bet if you went out and and put a little email out to that group of guys we had a breakfast with the other day, uh, I bet you'd convince some of them to come with you. Right, we had a breakfast um, with Dan from tropicalmba.com and we uh, were meeting up with all the uh, top secret entrepreneurs <laughs> and uh, expats here in Ho Chi Minh City. Here, here's my question though, Dan. You're, you're talking about this lifestyle. Uh, and by, how, how many foot massages is it a week, by the way? 
Uh, I'd say three. Three foot massages you know, a week. What I do is I listen to audiobooks while I'm doing it, so it's like uh, I'm trying to maximize my. Well, you're you're a greedy, <laughs> selfish savage. Here, here's no, but here's the real question. I think people want to know. I I certainly want to know. If somebody has this mentality that hey, yeah, you can fly to Bangkok, but your flight might crash because it's the third world airlines, or yeah, you can eat for cheap, but you're probably gonna get a parasite and die. Can you change that person's mind? Like, people who it's like, well, that's great, because we talked about this on Nomad, and people say, well, that's great, but you're gonna be dead. What do you say? Can they be changed? Can uh, they be turned around? Yeah, I think so. I mean, well, first off, the airline thing is pretty easy to turn around, right? Because you can just look at the safety records online and I'm a huge fan of the air industry and I, I like to follow data like that and it's brilliant. I mean, you're not going to, you're, you're, you're legitimately putting yourself at harm's way when you cross the street in Vietnam. There's no question about that. Um, is it a little bit more dangerous and perilous? Perhaps. However, I would say healthcare is generally better in this region, uh, in particular if you're in Thailand. Um, you know, so that's worth looking into too. If you have a health condition, there's great opportunity for medical tourism, both for entrepreneurs and for patients. Or as Stefan Molyneux says, medical refugeeism. There you go. Absolutely. You would do. Th- you would get a surgery here. Oh, no question. Would you send your girlfriend to get a boob job here? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't do that because I don't think she needs one. But. Right. <laughs> Dan from TropicalMBA.com is my guest. I, I want to get to this. Uh, By right. the way, I just had a friend. I, I right. just did a surgery yeah. in Jakarta. Right. And you wouldn't believe the costs for major surgery. Really? Um, it, you know, if you were to, I mean, I don't even know what the cost would be in the United States, but you wouldn't be able to pay it. And here it's out of pocket, uh, beautiful, sweet, in the hotel, high level of service, um, you know, highly educated surgeon who was extremely communicative, a wonderful experience. I think this is the way that people are going to bypass Obamacare in the future. It was, you know, 20 years ago, I was in Portugal, and you'd, 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 you'd hear people locally, they would see, oh, you're from the U.S., and they would say, uh, yeah, you know, one of our leaders just went to the U.S. for health care. Mm. That's going away. I think that the next step is going to be people who are going to go to the Philippines to get a tooth filled for $28 by an American-trained dentist, or they're going to come to Bangkok. No or they're going to they're gonna be in this region. Oh, yeah. Ian just went to the dentist the other day uh, by a Canadian uh, born and trained uh, dentist who's coming here looking for opportunities as well because here people pay cash. So, I mean, it can be good for the entrepreneurs in the medical profession. And you're not getting shaken down by the tax Gestapo here. Is no, that true? It's not happening. Right. Dan is uh, the guy behind TropicalMBA.com, and he has his own podcast, too, the Tropical MBA podcast on iTunes. We talked... The other day at nomadcapitalist.com about productivity hacks, ways to uh, stretch your dollar. And we, we touched <laughs> on this a little bit. Let's talk about some of the productivity hacks you use here in, in Vietnam to sure. stretch your dollar, get more work done, be more successful. Maybe even than counterparts in the land of the free. <laughs> okay, well, the land of the free is in- incredibly intensive in terms of your lifestyle. I mean, you can't afford multiple maids, multiple assistants. Uh, you know, all kinds of personal services here are cheap, right? You know, going to the spa for refreshment, your, your monthly gym membership, your haircuts and grooming. Uh, you can have someone prepare food for you if you want. I can get food delivered to the door. I mean, the lifestyle expenses are absolutely at zero. People say that's grandiose and that's not necessary, though. What, what do you say to that? I say if your business is important to you, I don't want to be doing repetitive tasks. Laundry. Add no asset value. Yeah, add no value to my life. I don't want to do laundry. I don't want to cook. Uh, and everybody has their passions or whatever. I don't want to clean my house. I don't want to think about the plumbing and who's going to fix it. I heard that there's a system here where if you get sentenced, like a political prisoner, you get sentenced to jail. There's a way you can uh, work out something behind the scenes and you can pay someone to sit in jail as your proxy. Can you, can you, can you Dan, and- have you, Dan Andrews, paid people to go as your dating proxies? Well, I'm sitting here with you today. <laughs> Uh, okay, here's the let me let me ask you this because you're you're a uh, you're the Tropical MBA podcast expert. Okay. You have lots of people coming to tropicalmba.com. People respect your opinion. Sure, you're you're a big guy here in Ho Chi Minh City. <laughs> You've got businesses all around the world, a vast global empire. Here, here, yes. Let me. Let me just gonna ask the question. I think Go people, on. people really want to know. This is what people. It's on the top of their minds. Are you Dan Andrews making seven figures a year? So, 
I will not talk about my gross profits or personal income, but I, I'm, are we allowed to say the revenue figure, Ian? We're, we're happy to say that, right? Sure. Yeah. I just got to check with the boss first. Everybody has a boss, by Dance the way. Dance proxy is sitting <laughs> on the couch. Our Q2 run rate is $2.43 million. $2.43 In right. sales. So you, so your business, is it's an eight-figure? Uh, no, it's a seven-figure business. Seven-figure, that's per quarter. No, that's the run rate. That's if you, the run, an, right, if you okay. annualize the run rate, right. so that would be an so you're, but a seven, a multi seven figure business. Yes, that's your business. Correct. You readily admit that. I do. Yeah. Right. So how does someone? I'm very proud to admit it. Because I'll tell you why. Because five years ago I was broke, man. I had negative ten thousand dollars. I had a job that paid me a lot of money. I had a bunch of loans. I had a, a stupid car that I owed seven thousand dollars for. And uh, I was commuting for two hours a day, and I thought, man, there's got to be a better life. This sucks. Um, this is it, living in California is so expensive that I'm making six figures, and I'm net losing every year. And it, you know, you talked earlier about productivity hacks. One of the things I thought is, man, if you want to grow a business, you need a team. And staffing in California is absurd. I mean, who's who in their first few years of business has an extra 45 grand laying around? I think every entrepreneur, you go out there and you want to start a business or you you think of an idea. And I think if you're within that Western mindset, you run through so many ideas where it's like, wow, this is a great idea. But, you know, $300,000 a year to staff the thing. <laughs> exactly. And so I have to move that, to San that, Francisco. That, that ruins it. I have to move to San Francisco. I have to you know, do the dog and pony show. And then I have to have another boss, someone who gives me a couple million dollars. And that's, that's just the beginning of the pain, right? So why not say, work at that job, get rid of the car loan, eat rice and beans, save up $50,000 or even 20, move here to Ho Chi Minh City and start getting traction. You, for $20,000, Andrew, you can live here for an entire year. So as a bootstrapping creative entrepreneur, that's a, that's a, significant portion of your total creative life and why not invest in yourself first come to a place like Coachman City get yourself in a community where a lot of passionate people are doing the same types of things and bootstrap yourself something that's going to be meaningful uh, Dan is from tropicalmba.com and you should check out his uh, podcast he's, own, he's got his own uh, podcast going to thousands of people every, uh, uh, every week uh, talk about then Dan uh, the idea of uh, Somebody who uh, wants to get their foot in the door. You wrote something about ways to get your dream job. Ten tips for your dream job. Can you share some of the tips for someone who's looking for a dream job or a dream opportunity? So what opportunity seeking, you're in the wrong barrel. You know, uh, successful... It, you know, there's a space called the business opportunity space, right? If you're sitting in a lecture hearing about a, a wonderful business opportunity, trust me, it's not a or wonderful... trading <laughs> options. It's not a, yeah, or, or buying into franchise. Green means go. All these kinds of things right. that people think about. Or the passive income dream where it's all just put X amount in the bank and then this is going to... Well, all that stuff's not going to work. I think... One thing that the four hour work we put forward is this idea of the muse, which is that the Tim Ferriss book. Yeah, the ebook on the sidebar, and it's just the thousands of dollars rolling in every day because people are buying your tips, ebook, or whatever. It's not that easy. Not happening. What you need to do is learn the entrepreneurial skill set. You need to reset your whole brain about this stuff. You need to learn how successful people get it done. Are you are you a lifelong entrepreneur though? Because some people say you have it or no. you don't. I don't know what whatever it was. I didn't have it. So I you, you were negative ten thousand dollars. I was not lemonade stand right. kid at age four. I right. didn't know about this stuff. I, you know, everybody has their strengths and weaknesses. So I don't know about that. What I do know is that you can learn how to be an entrepreneur, and the best way to do it is to go work for one. You got to get out of this thing where you're spending ten hours a day in one life path, hoping to preserve two or three hours in the evenings trying to do a completely different life path. So check out the monk and the riddle. It's this idea, this book. Uh, that talks about this idea of you can't do one thing in order to do another. And I think the best way to cash flow your entrepreneurial education is to get that job, to get the apprenticeship, uh, and to learn firsthand by doing how this stuff gets done. Right. And look, it's not rocket science. That's the greatest thing. There's a lot, of people, a lot of people in my life that are a lot smarter than me, have a lot more talent, and they chose a different road say to be an academic or an engineer or X, Y, and Z. I talent think doesn't, you're saying is talent doesn't matter. 
It's, I, it's the oft the oft traveled, but the talent is not. It doesn't. It doesn't matter what your SAT score is or, or or how smart you are. I'm a mediocre entrepreneur. Right. And we are doing quite alright. But you're a multi. You're a multimillionaire. I'm not a multimillionaire. No. No. Well, that's disappointing. <laughs> well, it depends how you count. And I would count liquid cash. You're a multimillionaire in Vietnamese dong. Definitely. <laughs> Uh, Dan from TropicalMBA.com. Give, give, what's the uh, th- what's your number one tip? If someone's listening, they say, you know what, I, I like what Dan's saying, but I, I've got these I've got these hangups. Just recap everything for me in the number one tip you would give to somebody. I think the best way to change your life is to change the kinds of relationships you have in your life. Um, because this is like a it, I, I call it getting to the table. If you're sitting around a table on Saturday night trying to convince a bunch of people that entrepreneurship is the way to go or trying to you know lobby for support for the things that you really desire the most in your life you're at the wrong table you need to find a way to get into the room with people that are living the types of, uh, the living the life that you want to live find a, and the only way they're going to let you sit at that table is if you're providing value to them so then you're going to get yourself in the habit of providing value to powerful people who have the same kinds of interests that you do and that to me you know if you want to change your life change your relationships and I you spent a lot of time by the way at the beginning of this whole journey trying to convince everybody in my life about what I was about to do Right, trying to solicit support. Don't you think it's a good idea that I'm going to go be? Of course, nobody thinks it's a good idea. No right. one's going to give you a permission slip. You have to give it to yourself. You have to give yourself permission to That's do what it. you want. To get out of the uh, the rat race. To get out of the mindset, the limiting belief. And we call it. You know, I like this image. I used to be on the hamster wheel. Right. Now we focus on flywheels. And the thing about flywheels is, we all know that once they've got momentum, they spin on their own. But it's really hard to get them started. And so you, it, it, I mean, those first two or three years of our business, it wasn't, you know, running around the world and jumping on that Bangkok airplane and, and then going back to New York for a summer and forget it, man. It, it was tough. It was like, do I make money or do I hire the next two team makers? It was, am we, are we going to make uh, payroll this month? Uh, is everything going to blow up in our faces? You know, you got to go through those few years if you want to make it happen. What do you see coming then for Vietnam? Is this going to be a place that you're going to want to live two years, five years, ten years? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think what's I, the future? I want to live here more five years. From really? Now. Absolutely. I mean, I, I used to live here in 2008. Uh, the internet would cut off at 3 p.m. every day when the rains came. Now the internet's 35 down at 3 p.m. The rate of change and growth and uh, it's, it's, it's a stunning place to be. So, and you're seeing the VCs come in. You're seeing the startup guys come in. You're seeing the youth culture everywhere starting to express themselves. The first generation uh, really outspoken, uh, speaking their beliefs, being artists. Uh, you you said honor. if you have $3 million, nobody cares here because there's so much, there's so much <laughs> money. You're saying if you, you just, just put the ego away. Yeah, I, no, no, one, no one here in Asia. I mean, you wrote a great article about going around to bankers in Hong Kong. Uh, they don't care. Uh, oh, you, you have a couple million dollars. They don't need your money. Big deal. Right. I mean, open up a cafe on the corner, hot shot. You know? Right. It's just, look. Like, it, it is amazing, I think, that when you get out of whatever the country is. And it was funny. I was talking to a guy from France yesterday who says, we're the opposite of the United States. We all have been taught to hate the country. <laughs> Whereas everyone in the U.S. thinks it's the only country. It's 4 or 5%. The other 96% don't care where you're from or that you have $3 million from there. They have their own $3 million. Sure. And That's what you're saying. And, well, in, in places like this, there's not a shortage of capital. There's a shortage right. of talent. So bring your talent. Do you think there's a shortage of talent when it comes to hiring for your ventures? Is it hard? No. Uh, so here's the biggest movement, I think. Hire people who want to travel. So... One of the things that the four-hour work we put forward that was so brilliant is how time, income, and mobility work together as a system. So if you don't want to compensate someone so much in cash, or if you want to lower your cash burden, why not compensate them with in, uh, mobility and time? So for, for our employees, our expat employees, they can live wherever they want. They can work whenever they want. We focus on results, not ass in chair, so to speak. Um, and so our cash burden is much lower. I would, if, you, if you offer an expat, college educated, fresh out the, the kitchen, uh, someone who wants to be an apprentice for your company, $2,000 a month here in Southeast Asia, dream job, no question. Same person would be making 40, 
thousand dollars a year. Plus what about taxes. local people? What about the local staff? The assistant, the developer, developing hugely. You know, one of the things that's a trend in Southeast Asia is the preeminence of the Philippines for virtual assistants. It's done. It's it's going away. It's corroding because what's happening is you're having stronger cultures with stronger educational institutions, which is places like Vietnam, places like Indonesia and Malaysia. You don't like the Philippines. You're not a fan. I'm a huge fan. I mean, I, really? used, I used to live there, yeah. but I'm not. I'm not on the let's hire Filipinos trumpet like I was three years ago. And the reason is, when I lived here in 2008, the level of English was dramatically lower than it is now in 2013. The rest of the, the, of the region is learning English. And so the only edge that the Philippines has now is the accentless English. So for things like being, hiring assistants, hiring uh, marketing assistants, hiring people to uh, do... You don't need someone without an and I, and, I, and I think that the most important thing for any business, maybe not, so, but most businesses, is just to be authentic and just, you know what? Hey, you know what? I have a Philippine, I have a Vietnamese assistant. Absolutely. I'm not going to hide it. You know, I, I don't, I didn't hire the diva in, <laughs> here in Century City. I mean, no, but really, don't you, people, I think, because I've had this earlier in business where you outsource something, but you try and cover it up. And I, I think you just have to be authentic. And well, say, so, you know, this is what I ha- this is what we're doing. Well, there's a big difference between outsourcing and hiring a virtual team. So, right. and I think that that's a trend that's been happening amongst the lifestyle designers, so to speak. I mean, it used to be I'm going to get an outsourcing firm in in Philippines, and hey, I don't blame your customers if they're pissed if you're sending them into an inbound call center somewhere. I want to talk to somebody that wears the T-shirt. I want to talk to somebody that knows the product, that's on the team and cares. And if that person has a Vietnamese name, I don't care. But it's sometimes nice to rename them Cindy. <laughs> Dan Andrews is the Tropical MBA. You can find him at tropicalmba.com. Thanks, Dan, for uh, joining me on the show. Thanks so much, Andrew. Nomadcapitalist.com is the uh, website. And, of course, global entrepreneurship, one of the keys to finding true personal and economic freedom anywhere in the world. You can learn more at nomadcapitalist.com. This is the Nomad Capitalist Report.